The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. As an addiction psychiatrist, I have been grateful for the tools at my disposal, which have been helpful for many people. But I also recognize that addiction is far more complex than a disease, a dopamine loop, or a bad habit in need of medicines or self-help books. There is a deeper process at play requiring our sensitivity and attention, and that touches on issues relevant to all of us, including our values, our culture, and our ways of being. Hi, everyone. It's Tuesday. I'm your host, Michael Kovnat, and this is the next Big Idea Daily. Now, what exactly is addiction? Is it a disease, a moral failing, a spiritual crisis? If you or someone you care about has struggled with addictive behavior, you know it's not any one thing, and it's shrouded in misunderstanding. Here to puncture the many myths that surround the condition is Elias Dakwar, author of the new book, The Captive Imagination, Addiction, Reality, and Our Search for Meaning. Elias is a psychiatrist and an associate professor of psychiatry at Columbia University. Here he is to share five of his big ideas. Over the course of my medical and scientific work, I've evolved my understanding of addiction and mental illness to better fit the needs of my patients and adapt to new data. Where I've landed is very different from the standard story. A key idea of the book is that addiction is a crisis relevant to all of us, a crisis of being human. Here I discuss five popular myths that might be getting in the way of better understanding and addressing addiction. Myth one, drugs are the problem. Drugs are as dangerous as fire, and also just as helpful when approached thoughtfully. Yet, we generally regard drugs with suspicion. One reason for this is that they are believed to have what scientists call abuse liability, which means a property inherent to the drug that compels misuse or addiction. And abuse liability is thought to result from drugs acting, to a greater or lesser degree, on certain brain circuits and modifying them over time, rendering the brain more vulnerable to problematic and compulsive use. Social policy to combat addiction is therefore focused on cutting off access to certain drugs, primarily through criminalizing them. It's highly problematic to focus on the harms of drugs to the exclusion of a more balanced perspective. This is like regarding fire as possessing, say, forest fire liability and criminalizing it because it is inherently dangerous to forests. And there are also real-world consequences to this perspective, beginning with the direct harms that have resulted from the war on drugs, such as mass incarceration and black market adulteration of substances. The most flagrant issue is that the data simply don't support this story. Most people who use drugs, and this goes for all drugs, including highly vilified substances such as heroin or methamphetamine, are able to maintain responsibility without going off the rails. Only a fraction of people who use drugs, in other words, develop addiction, which indicates quite clearly that drugs are not the main issue. Further, there are behaviors that resemble addiction, such as problem gambling, that don't involve drugs at all. So if drugs aren't the culprit, what is? Myth two, the brain is the problem. It seems clear that certain people are more vulnerable to a diagnosable addiction than are others with this vulnerability likely underwritten by genetic, personality, environmental, and psychiatric factors. And even though drugs might not be the cause, it's believed that they can trigger a susceptible brain into developing an addiction, as might also be the case with certain activities such as gambling. Much has been made of neuroimaging data to support this claim, such as data showing different patterns of activity in the brains of addicts versus those of non-addicts. These data are taken to mean that addiction is the result of pathology in the brain. But as I show in this book, the brain disease model has major problems. The biggest problem is that we are not merely our brains, social, ecological, relational, cultural, and existential factors. These are given short shrift in the brain model, if given attention at all. Our relationships to one another and to the earth, our values and purpose, our notions of well-being, the quality of our freedom and experience, all of these play very important roles in our lives and in addiction and should be considered to better understand addiction. Now consider the parallels between addiction and apparently normal, widespread human phenomena that have nothing to do with brain disease, such as religious devotion, nationalism, 
ideological commitments, consumerism, militarism, even scientific investigation and creative achievement. All these phenomena speak to an important dimension of existence, which gets to the heart of both addiction and human suffering more generally, our attachment to imaginal and idealized worlds, be it a state, a religion, a cause, a theory, an idea, an intoxication. And often this attachment can lead to quite devastating consequences, regardless of whether we are diagnosed with addiction. Addiction, in other words, has an important imaginal component that needs to be considered for us to make any progress in understanding and treating it. Myth three, addiction is a disease. We have a deep need as human beings for meaning, for a purposeful life, for authenticity, and for making sense of the world. This is a core part of our lives, whether we are artists, businessmen, scientists, or addicts. I show in this book that the most fruitful way to understand addiction is as an especially visible and anguished instance of this basic human striving. This gets at why addiction can be so difficult to break. Addiction is deeply meaningful, providing a path through the world for the affected person that is familiar, comprehensible, and anchored in experiences of value and purpose. Of course the person will have difficulty giving that up. Yet, despite its familiarity and meaningfulness, there is something unreal about this path as well. The whole production can, in fact, be at odds with reality, or at least worsening the suffering it is intended to console. For example, a person may find in alcohol a kind of sanctuary, imagining intoxication as a solution to certain troubles. And the person with addiction continues to regard it as a sanctuary, even when it becomes, in reality, a prison. Which brings us to another tendency. We are prone to mistake the unreal for the real. This confusion can be particularly thorny because reality is profoundly elusive, despite how eager we are to settle the matter. Many unrealities compete for our attention regularly, with very little to guide our way and much to confuse us. Addiction is a potent example of this yearning to exist in a meaningful reality, and is also an example of our confusion inflamed to a critical point, with our unrealities no longer fitting seamlessly into our lives, but tearing us apart. And we cling to our unrealities, even when they begin to unravel, even when we begin to unravel. For a simple but profound reason, it is better than being meaningless. We are held captive, whether as addicts, believers, or citizens, to a reality entirely made up, though deeply meaningful, deeply compelling, and deeply destructive. Myth four, people with addiction lack freedom. A fundamental question is why people with addiction continue making the same destructive decisions repeatedly. They seem to recognize the problem and then end up in the same trap. The common understanding is that the person's free will has been disrupted fundamentally at the brain level. They can no longer exercise the freedom to make the right choices for themselves, to control themselves, and are steered instead to serve the drug to the detriment of everything else valuable in their lives. A common metaphor is that the brain has been hijacked by the drug. But the same imagination that exercised the freedom to find an alcohol a sanctuary and to imagine the world accordingly might at any moment reimagine the entire world in a radically different way. Population-wide data support this, as does clinical experience. A pivot occurs, sometimes all at once and without treatment towards a wholly different way of being, where the entanglements of the past no longer have us in their grip. Some patients describe it as waking up from a dream, but maybe a more accurate way of putting it is that they move from one imagined world, one dream, to another. The old reality comes to be reimagined and transformed into another, more conducive to our flourishing. This freedom to transform reality is what initiated addiction and is also what allows us to move beyond it. It remains present even in our darkest days. By remaining attentive to this freedom, we can better understand the roots of addiction, as well as mobilize more skillfully the imagination to find a more authentic way. Which brings us to the final myth. Addiction requires a medical solution. What do AA, religion, indigenous rituals, therapeutic communities, yoga, meditation, drama therapy, narrative therapy, Charismatic healing, wilderness retreats, and a creative practice have in common? 
They all involve a steady and persistent reimagining of oneself, one's place in the world, and one's relationships to foster greater attunement and authenticity. And they all might be helpful for addiction. It's not to say that a medical approach is without value. As an addiction psychiatrist, I have been grateful for the tools at my disposal, which have been helpful for many people. But I also recognize that addiction is far more complex than a disease, a dopamine loop, or a bad habit in need of medicines or self-help books. There is a deeper process at play requiring our sensitivity and attention, and that touches on issues relevant to all of us, including our values, our culture, and our ways of being. I invite you with this book to recognize in addiction a process that might be relevant to you too, even if you have never touched a drug in your life. There's always opportunity to imagine ourselves and the world more truly. Okay, thank you, Elias. Listeners, you can get a copy of The Captive Imagination at your favorite bookstore. And if you got something out of this episode, please consider leaving us a rating or review in your podcast player. It'll help spread the power of big ideas. I'm Michael Kovnat. See you tomorrow.